Thank you, Professor Sirak. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for another year at Passion for Knowledge. And now let us introduce our next speaker. Uh, Sandra Diaz is a leading scientist in the field of ecology, especially in botany, a Nobel laureate who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. She's a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I was awarded the Princess of Asturias Research Prize in 2019 for her fight against climate change and her defense of biodiversity. Sandra Diaz is a firm advocate of the web of life in the face of the climate crisis, and the title of her conference is Of Plants and Peoples, Plant Biodiversity and Its Connections with Human Beings. Professor Diaz, the floor is all yours. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you very much for being here. Um, first of all, I want to thank the entire organization team, and uh, particularly teacher, Professors Pedro Miguel Echenique and Ricardo Diez um, for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to experience the legendary Basque hospitality and for giving me, of course, the chance to be here at Passion for Knowledge. I can say uh, now firsthand that this legend is fully justified, of course. Y me gustaría comenzar. And I would like to start with um, uh, this presentation with some non-rhetorical questions to the audience. First of all, I'd like to ask you, how many species of plants did you encounter today? Lo más probable. Well, it is likely that the vast majority of you encountered a minimum of 10 species. But uh, the majority of people don't even notice it. For most, plants are just the backdrop to their daily lives or selfies. And this is so common that it has its own name. It's called the plant blindness syndrome. But uh, it is um, enormous ignorance and arrogance on our part. Let me tell you why, why I'm saying this. Plants are not uh, so many. There aren't any many species compared to other organisms. They're only 20% of the whole of the species known by science. But they represent more than 80% of the living mass of, on the planet. And the most impressive thing here is what they do chem chemically. Aerobic photosynthetic organisms, including plants created and continue to create our world, or rather, the part of the world that is really relevant to human beings, which is just that uh, really thin skin of the planet called the biosphere. So within this critical zone of the biosphere, um, everything is recycled and everything is reused over and over and over again. So, for instance, the wonderful drinks and delicious um, snacks we had yesterday evening, um, and the cockroaches that eat garbage, and uh, um, the giant squid from the Atlantic coast and uh, all our distinguished audience and their elegant outfits. We are simply different recipes combining more or less the same ingredients. I, myself, for instance, am nothing more than a temporary uh, assembly, a temporary assembly of borrowed molecules. And this has been going on for billions of years. For billions of years, molecules have been circulating between the living world and the inert world. Beings eat each other, 
and when they die, they decompose and transform back into inert matter and so on and so forth. But there is a crucial detail here. The vast majority of organisms do not have the capacity to generate life from inanimate molecules. Only a few groups, including plants, can do something wonderful, which is a process, a wonderful process that is aerobic photosynthesis. And this process consists of, quite simply of capturing three really very abundant um, elements, which are sunlight, inert carbon from the atmosphere and water, and then combining organic molecules and in the process as a waste product emitting oxygen. So this is the oxygen that animals use uh, because animals need oxygen and they also eat plants and in turn exhale the carbon dioxide that by chance sustains photosynthesis. It is the raw material for plants. If you think about it, photosynthesis is truly an act of supreme alchemy. Imagine how we would celebrate it if we had invented it. However, we do not consider it to be important because we don't do it ourselves, but any weed that grows between uh, two pavening stones can do it. So, the air we breathe is a biological construction, ultimately a product of uh, photosynthesis. Um, 21% of the air in the atmosphere is oxygen, and that's why animals as large as humans and elephants and whales can exist. And that's also why everything catches fire so easily on this planet of ours. So, when we wonder what plants, uh, plants are for, besides providing a good selfie background, it is common for people to say the following. Well, at least, to me, most of the people tell me that they provide the oxygen we need to live. That's the answer I get. I don't know if you agree with that. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint, but in reality, much of the oxygen in the atmosphere that we enjoy today is not the work of the plants that surround us today. Land plants emerged about 400, from, sorry, about 470 to 420 million years ago. And the, the great oxidation period, the period in which the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere increased dramatically, occurred much earlier, about 2.4 billion years ago. So, before the plants emerged. And um, the beings responsible for this were not plants, actually, but rather microorganisms, photosynthetic microorganisms, like the ones you see up on the screen. So, what I mean by this, well, uh, it's not that plants do not actually produce oxygen. Of course they do, but uh, they, and all other organisms also consume it through respiration. So at any given time, only a truly tiny portion, something like 0.0001% of the oxygen produced, contributes to the air reservoir.
the proportion of oxygen in the air has been more or less the same for millions of years. It hasn't been affected by human activity. And the oxygen concentration that we now have uh, is enough for millions of years. So we don't have to worry about running out of oxygen. Currently, that is the list of our problems. So, we may wonder if we don't need plants to produce oxygen. Then, why worry about them? One possible reason is simply solidarity and empathy with other living things and our moral duty to protect them. Do you know how many species of plants are known to science on the planet? Almost 400,000. You may have heard that biodiversity is becoming extinct and uh, you may have also heard um, from some deniers that um, there have actually always been extinctions and so this is normal on our planet. But let's look at the facts that science offers us in this regard. Here on the chart we see what is, when in vertical we see the uh, extinction speed and here we see um, pre-human times and in brown we see human times. And this represents what we call the uh, average background extension. It is the average extension speed before humans appeared on the planet. So, and here we've got, we have the current rate the current extinction rate for all known organisms. So, on the one hand, it is true that extinctions have always happened, but it is also true that the speed, the rate at which these extinctions are occurring today is unprecedented in human history. It is higher than the average over the last 10 million years. And uh, if we look specifically for, for plants, this is the natural extinction rate of plants in pre-human times, and this is the current one. It seems low relative to other organisms, but it is, it is about 500 times higher than the rate without human intervention. It's estimated that almost 40% of all known species of plants are threatened currently to some extent. And among these, there are just over 5,000 species that are in what we call critical danger of extinction, which basically means that they have a 50% likelihood of disappearing forever over the next 10 years. And there are some that are, are already officially extinct in the wild and only exist today uh, in cultivated form, thanks to the care uh, given to them and, and the fact that they're in botanical gardens. Perhaps the most pathetic case The most pathetic case is that of this one, this poor, poor but very venerable individual. It's called Woods Cycad. It is the only individual uh, which is currently there, which has been find, found in the wild. They're main, male and female ones, and this is a male one. And uh, it's now been living for over 100 years in a little pot, well, a rather large pot, in fact, in Kew Gardens. They, there are uh, other species of the same, other uh, individuals of the same species, but because they've been cloned, they're all men, they're all blokes, which is a bit sad. 
Now, some of you might be moved by this, but some may not. Some might say, well, you know, now that we know that we're not going to suffocate because of a lack of oxygen, uh, and, and from a stri strictly anthropocentric point of view, well, maybe it's not the end of the world if some of the plant species disappear. Maybe it's not such a terrible thing. That's what might, some people might say. But just so happens that plants are a really important part. There are really important threads that hold together the tapestry of life on our planet. And since all living beings are connected to that tapestry, we're all interrelated. And that means that plants are a source of incalculable contributions to human well-being. Let me give you some examples. Plants are the basis of our physical survival. Why? Well, because they provide food for ourselves and they provide food for domestic animals. Uh, they also regulate the climate and the quality and distribution of water on the planet. Uh, they contribute to all aspects of human health. They're the basis of our economies. They also provide inspiration for our discoveries and for the images and the stories, the images and stories that really sustain our identity as members of different groups, different cultural groups, as social groups, and also as unique individuals ourselves. So basically, we wouldn't be who we are without plants. And we probably wouldn't be at all, we wouldn't exist without plants. So the impoverishment of plant life on our planet <coughs> leads to the loss of crucial benefits for human well-being. But plants aren't just essential for the physical and psychological life of individual people, ourselves as individuals. Right from the dawn of humankind, our social relationships with other humans and, and most human interactions within and between different societies have been mediated by something or other connected to plants. If we look at the history of humanity over, well, at least the last 1,000 years, with all its creation of wealth, discoveries, progress, also with all its injustices, tragedies, plundering, migration, slavery, empires, imperialisms, all of this, all of the, the, all of this entire history can be told through the plants that have mediated it. And we're talking here about opium, uh, sing, singona, tea, spices, spices, sorry, prickly pear cacti, uh, cochineal, tobacco, uh, cotton, rubber, quebracho, potato, soybeans, oil palms, many, many more. And in all of these stories, these socio-plant stories, in all of these uh, stories, plants haven't just been passive or immobile objects. Right at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned the legendary Basque hospitality. And there's another legendary issue about this region that I would also like to mention now. So a close friend, wonderful colleague, once told me, well, you know, thanks to the courage, the ingenuity, and the persistence of the Basques, no invaders, no enemies were ever able to get a foothold in the Basque country. Yeah, and up until recently, I had uh, no reason to doubt what this person said to me until just a short while ago, I was on a trip. I was visiting different areas of this region and I saw for dozens and dozens of kilometers on either side of the road and stretching all the way to the horizon, I saw something that made me doubt it. And what was that? Cortaderia celoana, pampas duster, which is native to my land, apparently, at least, 
the pampas duster has managed to get a good foothold in the Basque country. And apparently, at least, it doesn't show any signs of being defeated in the near future. Now, for me, this is like, like a fairly eloquent example that far from being just inanimate objects that, we, that can be manipulated at will, and far from being simply a backdrop to human social drama, many plants have made use of this kind of intertwining with our social life to reach the most distant and unsuspected places, to adapt to those places and basically take over them, take them over. The vast majority of plants, I mean, we're talking here about 96%. So 96% of plants stay more or less planted where they are. So that's why they're called plants, because they remain planted. But the remaining 4% travel, and they travel over huge distances. So these traveling plants, well, some of them at least, have traveled all over the world. They take advantage of the enormous degree of connectivity which exists between different regions in the world, something that we ourselves have generated over recent centuries and particularly over recent decades. Now the majority of these traveling plants don't take root in the places that they travel to, but a very small proportion of them do. I think there are about 1,000 of them in the planet. They do, they take root in their new homes. They start to spread, to reproduce, and they became invasive. They become invasive species, and they uh, cause a lot of damage. We're talking about 0.3% of all the plants on the planet. It's a very, very small proportion, but these few plants really do create huge headaches for people. Uh, one example is the one that we've seen before. And I'm going to throw you, show you three examples uh, who are ranked very high on the world ranking of expansion and documented damage. Here we can see three of them up on the screen. So how and why do plants travel around the world? Well, sometimes, often, we transport them ourselves without meaning to. Uh, they're like stowaways, if you like. They're contaminants of crop seeds, or they're mixed uh, in the soil uh, of other plants, or they come in the packaging of different uh, objects and merchandise. But often, all too often, they travel because someone has bought them or transported them very deliberately and with a lot of care because they think they have an advantage or something and they don't take into account that they may be harmful to other uh, plants. For example, in the, the case of the pampas duster, it was introduced into Europe very deliberately as an ornamental plant. And in fact, you can still buy uh, pampas dusters in many garden centers today. Now, uh, the fact that uh, you have a problem with an invasive species from my region makes me feel a bit bad. So I try to find a sort of a counter example to compensate that. So I'm going to now tell you about a plant that isn't from Europe, but it is from the old world, but it's invaded my region. And it's done it for very curious reasons, much more so than the pampas duster. We're talking about privet. Privet uh, is this tree that you can see. Uh, they're not messy because they don't shed their leaves. And they've got a kind of a small, they're quite small and very disciplined shape. Uh, and they don't you know, make life diff they don't make life difficult for uh, the people who have to prune them. They don't interfere with the electricity cables that run overhead. They don't have roots that break the paving slabs, etc., etc. Which is why they became the perfect candidate uh, for public spaces, public gardens. 
And also uh, the maintenance services were delighted uh, because they provide a lot of uh, shade and they don't actually have to sweep up underneath them because they don't shed their leaves. But the problem is that it wasn't just the maintenance staff and, and the people who had to prune the trees that were delighted with this uh, new species because the species produce a lots of very fleshy fruits and they mature at the time when there are no native species producing fruits of this type because uh, they do it in autumn and winter. So, fruit-eating birds couldn't believe their luck. And in just a few decades, they had just dispersed them all over the country. And obviously this had consequences, quite devastating consequences out in the countryside because there was a very, a lot of pressure was put on native species that needed a, a lot of insulation, they needed a lot of sunlight to, to prosper. And there's another problem as well, because every spring this uh, species produces a lot of blossoms and that becomes a seasonal nightmare for a lot of people who have a really strong allergy to these, uh, these flowers and there's nowhere they can go because this plant is everywhere. But it's not just that the pampas duster or the privet are inherently evil plants. I mean, the vast majority of plants that aren't totally bad or totally good. They all, you know, have good bits and bad bits to them. But basically, plants, all that they're trying to do is to live and to prosper wherever they happen to be. And they're really good at that. They're really good uh, at resisting, in persisting, in adapting, in accommodating, in, in evolving. They're really good at that. And it's we who assign them positive or negative values. And we do that in accordance with our sectoral interests. And according to that, we either idolize them or we demonize them. We destroy them or we care for them. But in reality, plants have many different values. Now, some of these values can be measured very precisely. For example, in monetary terms. There have been some calculations, some estimates of how much money European imperial powers made throughout history from the cotton and sugarcane plantations in the New World. We can also uh, calculate the cost of this same process in human lives, for example, so the negative costs of that same process. Another example would be that actually recently a report was published quantifying the total damage caused by invasive non-native plants and animals worldwide and they concluded that it was about 400 billion dollars. Environmentalists, myself included, we can calculate fairly accurately how much carbon is captured and kept out of the atmosphere. And, uh, so the contribution to the fight against the greenhouse effect. Uh, so how much carbon is kept out of the atmosphere by, for example, a hectare of forest land made up of different species of trees. But not all plant values can be measured in monetary terms or in environmental terms or in terms of health even. Because some plants, many plants, have other types of values which are much more subjective and have to do with society, have to do with our own identity sometimes. For example, you could calculate very, very accurately the characteristics of the leaves, the stems and the seeds of oak trees. We can also very precisely estimate uh, their market price, the monetary uh, price or their monetary value of oak trees. But all of this information wouldn't come close to reflecting the value that oaks have in the Basque culture, for example. And furthermore, some plants have what's called a relational type of value. What are they? What are relational values? values in which what is valued is not the usefulness 
of the plant for my own purposes, for example, but rather what I, what I value is my relationship with that plant. I could give you a definition, a very academic definition of relational value, but I think this is much better and it sums it up much better. This is a quote from The Little Prince. And it has to do with the relationship between a human and a plant. A relationship that is irreplaceable. Up until just a little while ago, science didn't recognise relational value. But today, science does value relational value because it's understood, we've understood, that this type of value is absolutely fundamental. Uh, it, they're fundamental uh, in the decisions that people make in favour or against nature. And this makes some plants unique. So, an example from close by is the one that we can see here. The Saragoa oak. So, in addition to the collective and historical value of all oak trees in the Basque Country, there are some oaks in particular that are so unique, they're so valuable, that they even have their own name. And this is what we can see here on the screen. The Saragoa oak. And in fact, uh, I was privileged to go and see that oak tree and get to know that oak tree just a couple of days ago. And it's not just any old oak. So if someone came along and said, oh, let's I'm going to give you a new oak with similar characteristics, and even a, more, a prettier, a more beautiful oak, many people would be very angry, and it would be just as unacceptable as, you know, if someone came along and offered to replace a member of your family, even if that new person were younger, prettier, and, you know, much more intelligent and much more hardworking. Now, this whole idea of unique trees isn't something that just happens uh, with oaks and it doesn't just happen in the Basque Country. It happens all over the world. There are many baobabs in Africa that are unique. There's a lot of thebas, which are unique in Latin America. The cypresses uh, in the Middle East often are, are unique. This is the very highly revered cypress of Abarku in Iran, which according to legend was planted by Sorasta. So, plants have a multitude of values. Some of these values can't be condensed in a single, into a single property, but and they can't be measured, but doesn't mean they're less important. And it's really important to take all of these different types of values into account. So, to round up, just to conclude, plants are a fundamental part of the living tapestry that covers our entire planet. It's quite easy to imagine a biosphere without humans. It's much more difficult to imagine humans, or even the biosphere itself, without plants. Which is why our origin and our destiny are inextricably interwoven with plants, interwoven evolutionarily, ecologically, and socially. So basically, we don't have a future worth living without plants. And when we're working towards this possible future, this future that's worth living, it's really important to understand plants. But we need to understand them for what they are. We don't need to look at them as inanimate objects that do exactly and only what we want them to do. We, don't, we shouldn't look at them as a decoration or a backdrop to human drama, but we should look at them and understand them as active beings, as participants in the world, we should look at them as companions on the road, travelling companions with whom we coexist 
in an intertwined way. Thank you very much. Thank you.